We welcome you back to the steam room. Bernie Johnson and Charles Barkley. Special guest. Wow, look at you. Jumping right in there to introduce Special, ourselves. special guest, Ernie. Yeah, I mean to tell you. We've had some great guests on this podcast, boys and girls. If you haven't been listening, uh, and, and now look who's walking into the steam room. And please keep your towel on, Ahmad Rashad. <laughs> it's so <laughs> nice to be with you fellas. It's just wonderful. Give me something to do because I'm bored as hell. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know it's been so long since i've seen you on tv amon i guess it's been about three days three four days <laughs> I, I see you every sunday uh yeah. and and man has it been fun to watch that uh that last dance and 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 i'm look you are featured prominently and and, and for a good reason man because your relationship with michael uh, you know they don't get much tighter than that when's the first time you met him I met Michael uh, the first time I had sort of gotten even involved in who Michael Jordan was as John McEnroe told me about this guy. He said, you got to watch this guy in North Carolina. You got to watch this guy. So that's when I first saw him. That was in like 1983, I think. But NBC had just gotten basketball. And what they wanted to do, they were going to have this new show called Inside Stuff. I was going to end up doing basketball. So we went out and, sh and um, televised magic johnson's midsummer night dream charity game in the summer now this charity game wasn't like it was way better than the all-star game because these guys actually played i mean it wasn't it was like yeah we got a charity going but they were serious about who was going to win <laughs> who was going to play and so we did that game i met michael then we exchanged phone numbers and just became really really cl close friends over the over the years you know Ahmad we all been around a long time and you know obviously it was a long time ago but this last dance thing has brought back so many great memories uh what's been the best memory that you kind of like oh, i forgot about that you know there's been so many things when i sit and watch the thing and i think the first thing that comes to mind is i forgot how really good he was you know <laughs> i mean i really for, i mean i i was there the whole time you know, I was there for Charles's whole career also. And you forget how good these guys were. They were at a level, and it was a whole league that was at a level that was, it had not reached there again. And so I, re I was telling somebody the other day that during the playoff games, we would go in a room after the games, uh, late and smoke cigars and talk about the game and talk about all the plays. And I remember telling Quinn Buckner, I must have told him this like 10 times. It's like, hey, man, there's no way that Michael can play better than that. And then the next game, he played better than that. It was just a wonderful time to be around. And as I watch it, I re you know what I remember most about Charles? When they beat Chicago, we were at a restaurant eating. And after I had to interview Charles at the end of the game, and he said, the Lord told me that we were going to win the game, right? And it was kind of funny. You know, we laughed about it and the whole thing. Yeah. And the game was over. And, you know, Charles is always happy-go-lucky, just, okay, we got another one to play. And then that night, we were eating in a restaurant. I know you remember this, Charles. We're eating in a restaurant in a back room, Michael, myself, a bunch of other people, and Charles walked in. And Charles was making, just making jokes, like, you know, hey, what's happening, you guys? Yeah, we got y'all, and this kind of thing. And there was nothing said, <laughs> nothing. So Charles realized that, okay, I guess this ain't a fun room. I'm gonna leave the room. <laughs> so he, so, he so that, that wasn't a fun room. It wasn't a fun room. <laughs> but those are the kind of things that I that I remember, and it was um, it was just a wonderful time. Well, obviously, clearly, Michael's a bad loser. That's number one. <laughs> you, 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 you know, Ahmad, you've been in this thing a long time. I've been in it a long time. I've only been around two athletes that people flat out lose their mind over: Tiger Woods and Michael Jordan. We were obviously, I've been around Michael when we won playing against each other. Have, in, in your many years of being an NFL player and being a broadcast, have you ever seen the reception that Michael and Tiger get around crowds? No, it's almost like, um, and I was probably 12 or 13, it's almost like Elvis Presley. And people don't really remember that either. I mean, he could not go anywhere. It was like people would look at him as like he wasn't human. We didn't look at him that way. Charles yeah. and I didn't look at him that way. Yeah. He was just Michael. He was just a great player and one of the guys. Yeah. But everybody on the outside looked at him. I saw, I saw, I saw in the news. I saw Shannon Sharp 
say that when he met Michael Jordan, he levitated, man. I mean, I went up to him and the boy levitated. It's like, what are you talking about? He levitated. It's like, yeah. Uh, I, got a, I got a question for you, Ahmad. Did, when you're that tight with a guy, is it ever hard to report on him? No, 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 no. Two separate things. It was two separate things. And having been an athlete and having been in those sort of circum circumstances, reporting, you're only reporting on the game and you're reporting on whatever else. It's not like you're doing investigative reporting. And, hey, here's the thing. This is what guy's doing over there. It was all about the game. And I always kept it just there. And it was, I think what people don't really realize, I had the same relationship with Charles. I had the same relationship with Magic. I had the same relationship with Larry Bird. It was all the same thing. I, there was mutual respect when we spoke. And it wasn't about, I, they didn't have to feel like I was going to ask a question that was out of line because I knew what the subject matter was and what we were talking about. And I had friendships with all those guys. Michael and I had a special friendship. We were very, very dear friends and spoke a lot. But it wasn't too different from, you know, me. Danny Ainge was a, I had a camp. I worked at a football camp when I was in college. And Danny Ainge was one of my guys. He was 13 years old or something like that. And he was <laughs> such a little badass that he used to have to sit with me at lunch because the other guys were beating him up. He had like two <laughs> brothers that were older than him. And he was like this little wise ass guy. And his brothers were beating him up all the time. So I made him have lunch with me. He had to sit with, with me. I was a counselor. So, so there was relationships like that that went all the way through that. So when people just first saw Danny Ainge, Hell, I hadn't known him since he was 13 years old. So it was just a different relationship that I had with most of, with, with all the players. You know, Amal, I, we, I played against the bad boy Pistons mm -hmm. and you, you knew it was bad, but looking at the documentary over again, it's like, damn, these dudes out here really trying to hurt people. That, that actually to me, <laughs> when we having this debate, Listen, I'm not one of these old get off my lawn guys. The, the sure game you was are. So, uh, no, no, no. I'm not it, it, uh, earning from a common sense standpoint. Ask the Montez. He played in the NFL. I guarantee he say, yeah, I'd rather play today. You can't touch people. They're going to throw it 30 other times. You can't touch the quarterback. Everybody, and, and that's not the get off my lawn guy. That's just a fact. It's easier to play in the NFL today. Just like in the NBA. It's a lot easier today. But like I said, even though I thought about the Pistons a lot back in the day, watching Michael go through those guys, getting his butt kicked the first three times, that to me would make him, like what he went through, that's what to me makes him the GOAT. I, I agree with that because he, you know, it was one of those things where you weren't, the Pistons were ruling everything. If you went up there, <laughs> you were going to get beat up. If you tried to drive to the basket, you're going to get three or four times knocked down and not get fouled. <laughs> and not, there ain't going to be no whistle blown. So it took a special kind of person to sort of beat those and a special type of person to rally his whole team. You know, it's almost like a guy going down and getting a fight and saying, hey, man, we all going. And then everybody be psyched up till they all come. You know, so it was one of those things that he had raised everybody else's expectations and commitments to do what he was committed to do. I thought that was, I thought that was really, really something that I admired as an athlete for him to be able to do that. Knowing also the guy that I don't think it gets enough credit is Phil Jackson. Imagine trying to coach that team with all them weird dudes on that team. <laughs> I mean, how do you keep them guys together? You're going to say, Hey, we got one more year and you got all them different kind of personalities there. He did a wonderful job. Michael has always told me that the one thing he feels really uh, happy about or fortunate is that he had a coach like Phil that inspired him, that actually went at him, that actually I was watching the thing with, um, I don't know, the guard that went to Charlotte. Uh, BJ? BJ Armstrong. And, yeah. had the, and he had the great game. I said, so what happened? He said, man, after that game, man, Phil was on me like crazy. He said, man, how in the world you let that dude, I mean, just, going at him and everybody needs that everybody need you need a coach that can take you where you need to be and so that was the guy he was trying to get. mike would say no matter how many points i scored you no know, it would be like okay so well, what about your rebounds you didn't have much rebounds so if i did this phil always had something to inspire him to play better each and every night and all the way to that level that they went to which is pretty extraordinary ahmad would you guys talk about uh 
or would he seek counsel, seek advice from you? I mean, if he had something going on, would he ask you your opinion? I mean, like when it came down to he's going to try baseball, did you guys talk yes. about that? Did you tell yes. him, oh, yeah, go? Or did you say, ah, I don't know? I said, yeah, yeah I don't know. That's what I said. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like, what? You're going to do what? Play baseball? It's like I couldn't quite figure out how that was. But, no, we talked about everything. We discuss all kinds of different things like that. We would have, you know, a lot of times that I would spend time around him before a game. We talk about this much about the game and this much about anything, all kinds of stuff, you know. But but I, as I say that, I sort of had the same relationship with Charles. Charles and I would talk about all kinds of stuff, and you know, and still go play the game. And then maybe we talk about a specific player, or what do you think about that guy, or what do you think about this. So that was a sort of inside that I had as a reporter is I had relationships with everybody, not only Michael. And he had the same kind of, you know, he was a human being, so he'd have the same kind of conversations that, you know, that we all had. When did you, because you guys got me hooked on cigars, when did that start? <laughs> the first championship. The first championship, because we had, we got, we had gotten these cigars out in um, Las Vegas that had sweet tips on the end of them. So oh, we go out because you know we weren't real cigar smokers at that time. We had these sweet cigars, and so we just sort what, of what, what, what Swisher sweets? No, not Swisher sweets. It was a real, <laughs> okay. No, it wasn't that. It was a real cigar, but it had a sweet tip on it. All right, and you could only get them at this place out in Las Vegas. So we always had those, and then it got to the point where I would, if uh, if I was doing a game, uh, Michael and I would I would go to to the arena and find a room that we could go to while he got dressed. So I get to the arena, he come and we'd go to this room, Phil Jackson would come too, uh, and we'd go and sit down and we'd just talk, smoke a cigar, talk, laugh about uh, anything, some crazy thing in high school, some, the subject matter was different every single time, but that was, that was sort of the way that I got prepared to do my job and the way he got a chance to get away from everything and laugh about stuff before he went back into battle. And same with Phil. You know, you want to take this time to apologize to me for yelling at me uh, when I didn't know how to smoke good cigars. So, <laughs> er, so Ernie, so when I so I started hanging out with Michael and Ahmad, <laughs> and we'd play golf and we smoke. So I didn't know the difference between regular cigars and great cigars. So I started playing golf with these guys that they're smoking some <laughs> of the best stuff in the world, and I was just learning how to smoke cigars, and I would take like five or six to 10 puffs and put the cigar out. And these guys would look at me like, yo man, you got to finish that cigar. That's one of the best in the world. So then they taught me, Chuck, when you become a real cigar smoker, you got to have two sets of cigars. You got to have one for the riffraff who gonna take three or four puffs and put it out. And then you got to have the good stuff for real cigar smokers. And um, when, when my, Ahmad yelled at me that time, I got it, Ahmad. I got stuff for the riffraff, and I got a special for the guys who know what the hell they're doing. So I appreciate that. I forgive you for yelling at me. Thanks for taking us back to your days in the riffraff. <laughs> it was so funny. You know, the things I had to tell Charles is like, you know, these cigars we're smoking, it's about $100 a cigar. You know, you can't like take two puffs and throw it away. And Charles just thought it was like, he thought it was a- I thought it was a, a Swisher Sweet. He thought it was a Swisher <laughs> Sweet. So then he's like, hey, give Charles a cigar out of that other box. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so here, hey, I got, a, I got a question here for both of you, okay? So I'm, I'm counting up, so it's 82. So it's almost 40 years, Ahmad, you and, you and MJ have had this, this bond all right yeah going back going back to 82. chuck you used to have that bond yes right right yes yes do you do you wish you had what ahmad still has yes with michael yes then how are you going to fix it uh i don't know that yet ernie i don't know the answer to that question brother i wish i could give you a, a proper answer i don't know the answer to that question but obviously you want to fix it i would like to fix it but you know, Michael's doing great. Uh, I'm doing great. We had a disagreement. Uh, we're probably both too stubborn. Uh, let me rephrase it. I know we are both too stubborn. Uh, <laughs> so I think, seriously, I think we're both just, we're both just jackasses, to be honest with you. When it comes like, 
you know, Dr. Phil said this all the time. Uh oh. No, 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 Ernie. Wait, he has are a you getting are you getting ready to quote Dr. Phil? Yes, he I mean, is. That's no, why I no, said uh oh. No, 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 because he has a great point sometimes. He said, and I asked him, we were actually we were in Vegas playing black John blackjack one night, and I was just picking his brain because I love Dr. Phil's show. And he says, he talked about a right fighter. He says, most people go through life, they are hundred percent wrong, but their ego says, oh, uh, I'm just gonna ride. I'm right, I'm right, I'm right. And sometimes that's got myself into trouble. I can't speak for Michael. I think there's times being a right fighter, like I just wanna prove I'm right, even when I'm wrong. And that's got me in trouble at times. Ahmad, I think, see what I see in your future, Ahmad, is the Jimmy Carter role here. I can see you with MJ on one side and Charles on the other and you <laughs> join hands and you say, hey, this is it's, this is all over. Everybody, everybody make nice. I oh, mean, we're like, the, we're like the middle, or he's like, we're like the Middle East now. <laughs> yeah, this would be like Anwar Sadat and Menachem Begin back oh, in the day. Oh, Ernie, I like that. We'd have pulled them out. One. That yeah, is a so, big one. Yeah. So, so what are the chances and 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 Ahmad, how much thought do you think MJ gives to gives to something like this to you know making things right with guys who it used to be right with? I think that uh, people don't realize the relationship that Charles and Michael have had over the years, going way back, yeah. going way back to the point where I remember talking about. Uh, you remember the Olympic team that that you didn't make? Yeah. Because the, oh, coach yeah. Was, the coach was crazy or whatever it was. Uh, uh, <laughs> the words you're thinking of was just a prick, Ahmad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just a prick. And so I was. remember Michael telling me all about that and all that, that. But you guys were such great, you were soulmates. You're very, very dear friends. Sometimes I dream <laughs> that he is me. I just want to be like Chuck. I mean, Mike is Chuck. And somehow it just got out of whack somewhere. But there's no telling. You can't tell me you still don't love him. And he can't tell me he still don't love you. You just got some weird, it's almost like brothers that get, get into an argument. At some point you come back, but they're still family. You can say whatever you want that I know deep inside. I know both these guys as well as anybody could know them. And I know that it's only a matter of time. It's not, it's not anything that's, you know, death defying. It's not anything that's that deep at all. But, you know, time, life is like that sometimes. But it ain't gonna go on at some point. The other night, the other night you called me. When you called me the other night, I was sitting right next to him. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, and I was trying to put y'all on the phone. But you said some crazy stuff to me and then hung the damn phone up. Come on, there's your, <laughs> Ahmad, there is your opportunity. It was handed to you. There was the opportunity. Your Jimmy Carter moment. It's only a, it's only a matter of time. I mean, they're on their own. They're two grown boys. They both know what the hell's going on. And at some point, they'll get it together. But it's not like something like, I hate you and I hate you. That's not it at all. Never. So here's, I hate to throw another question at you, but so you're sitting there with MJ. Are you watching the, are you watching yeah. the show? Yeah. And Charles called out of the blue. So what's, so, so what's MJ's, has MJ already seen everything? Of course yeah. he has. Yeah, we all, I've seen it too. Already the whole thing. It. Yeah. Okay. So, Okay, so you've already watched it. You've already watched it all the way through before watching on, yes, like on, on like last Sunday. Uh huh. So nothing really is, is going to surprise you in that. Nothing. Okay. But it was. But as we watched it, we just laughed about stuff. You know, we remembered. You know, you'd see a game and you would remember stuff that was around the game. I remember one a game would come on and go, "Hey man, remember the time we had dinner at this place and whatever?" And we were drinking Long Island iced teas. I never drank one of them. And we talk about that or the time that yeah, when I came when you had them damn shoes on that were too small and you couldn't take them off at halftime because your feet were bleeding. We are laughing at stuff like that. Or a game is like, oh man, yeah, I remember that when this and that and that was happening. Or even the time when I talked about when Charles came into that room, when we were having dinner. We all laughed about that. So it's a, it's just a going back in time. And I'm sure Charles has the same thing. You oh, sort yeah. of sit down and you look back in time and you just remember the era. You, it was a wonderful era in NBA, in the NBA. It was, um, it was the coolest thing ever. There was the hip hop thing going on. It was all this, that, and the other. So we sort of went through a, a reminiscing and laughing 
about a lot of this stuff. And him talking about, you know, certain guys he was playing against or if something happened that didn't happen, it's like, I don't remember that. Or, or George Call saying he didn't remember walking by and not saying hi to him. Yeah. He knows damn well he remember. It was too much of it, too many of us at the table to watch them do it. It's like, that's not, that's not true. He did go by that and then he paid for it. But you have to, as an athlete, all of us try to find something to motivate us every single game. Michael does it to an extent that, you know, I've never seen. But I know when I played and I was playing against a guy, I was always looking for an edge. I was always looking at if I read something where he said he could guard me or something he's, I could sort of, in my mind, put it like he was disrespecting me. It helped me play harder that, that week. But at the end of it is, you know, you move on to the next one. But everybody, everybody does that. Ahmad Rashad, it has been, uh, man, it's been great catching up. And, Always. and again, your, uh, your contributions to this series have been, uh, have been awesome. And to, uh, to sports, Ernie, you yeah. know, he's probably not only that, I mean, and, and obviously, you know, I love him like a brother from being a hell of a player, going into broadcasting, being successful at it. He's one of the first to ever do it. He's been a blueprint for a lot of guys. Like, he don't even know this. He was one of the reasons I was going to go to NBC. Did you know that? I didn't know that. Well, because you're the first guy that I saw play. Right. Who actually went into broadcasting. Yes. Uh, so you were like a blueprint for all of us guys. So I, one of the reasons I was going to go to NBC was because of you. And unfortunately, I made the mistake of going to Atlanta and, uh, and TK and Mark Lavers got me drunk and I ended up signing with TNT, which was a blessing. Yeah, you're an easy date, man. I appreciate that, Charles, because I always felt to myself that I was trying to be an example of other young African Americans. Because when I first went on, there weren't many of us on TV doing anything. I was trying to set an example of something that we could all do. That you look at it and you say, shoot, Ahmad did it and he did it well. I want to do that too. So I was trying to make that example. And so when you tell me things like this, it just makes my heart feel good because that's what I was trying to do. That was my point to try to show that, you know, we aren't just people that just run up and down the court or run up and down the field and can only do that. There's a lot of things that we can do as young black uh, athletes that continue your life. You yes. Know, that kind of thing. So it was one of the things, it was one of those, and it was like, you know, it was only going this way. It was growing the whole time. And so for you to tell that to me, that, that makes my day. I really appreciate that. You're welcome, my brother. Thank you. Ahmad, thanks. Great talking to you as always. And, uh, Straight ahead there, kid, and keep it in the fairway. Always great to see you, Ernie. Look forward to seeing you on the yeah. golf course. Charles, you can come with us, though, but don't bring your clubs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. I love you. Be safe. All right, peace. Love you guys. Uh, uh, Later, man. Hey, Ernie. He's on my list, too. I'm getting all y'all back on the golf course. I'm coming out of this quarantine. I'm going to play good golf from now on. I'm letting y'all know this. <laughs>